<laughs> What's good, y'all? Episode 61. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope everybody is having a great week. Been a couple weeks since I did one of these. You know, I, I talk about a lot at the beginning of the show. I kind of talk about, as they say, how the sausage is made. So I, I don't know. I don't really watch other podcasts. I don't know if people discuss the process that goes into like their personal journey of doing the pod and the motivations behind it and all that. But like I like I will always say, this is kind of, you know, my version of personal journaling in a way. Certainly helps me flush out a lot of thoughts, kind of do some brain dumps on things I've been thinking about. And yeah, then one of the things I think about is this show itself and and doing this actual thing here. Because here's the issue I have, and I've touched on this before, and this coincides. I've, I've not been on Twitter now for a few weeks. I kind of do these hiatuses from social media or from Twitter in this case specifically because I start to feel like the energy bleeds into, starts to bleed into real life a little bit too much. You know, my whole thing that I keep talking about in the last few shows and such is this whole idea of of really living in the present and stripping everything away and just kind of existing with what is there in the present moment. And I struggle with that in relation to being on social media or what you would consider now they call content creation and content creators and stuff like that. And it's a tricky thing for me to reconcile because I don't know how much of that is my nature. And I know that prior to doing this, I had only really gotten on Twitter for a few years, not even under my real name, mostly to talk about political stuff. And, you know, prior to that, when everybody's on Facebook and Instagram, you know, I'm posting once a year for someone's birthday or something. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, while I recognize the benefits of this specific process here and how much I really love it and how proud of myself, by the way, this is all going to kind of go along with this episode. This episode, I want to talk a lot about progress. I've never really delved into progress and what that means and how we define it, engage it, and measure it. So I want to get into all that, but that kind of goes along with this, which is kind of practicing what I preach in that regard. And the more that I kind of dump these things out of my brain about living in the present and all the stuff about authenticity and genuine behavior and such, when I feel that within myself, it doesn't coincide with the part of me that's on Twitter all day. It's funny, I actually recorded an episode um, many months ago when I was on another hiatus from social, and I never aired it. I actually spoke to somebody before I put it out, and they were like, that's going to be kind of insulting to people, because I don't mean it. The reason I bring that up, and in that episode, in that unaired episode, I was really kind of bashing the whole social media deal, and I don't mean it in a way to put anybody down or how people choose to spend, because it might not feel the same to everybody and everybody's intentionality is always going to be a little different. And I've met some amazing people on there and I've made some real life friends on there and I'm going to be back on there soon. In fact, I think I'm going to get back on around when this episode airs. So I'm not putting any of that stuff down. I guess I just, my point being, if I ever kind of disappear from that for a while, it's pretty much always that it's just kind of a reset In general, I don't like the idea, even the healthy version of me, this is something I've also tried to kind of really reconcile and figure out which parts of me are kind of the conflicted, unhealthy, phobic reactions, for lack of a better term, versus what would I still be doing at my healthiest. And I do believe that the most optimal, healthy version of me doesn't really participate too much in that type of stuff. But then at the same time, because of this show and because of the video, and I I spoke recently, I do want to interact with people through this. So it it is a very strange dichotomy and it's a process. And I don't have that balance fully figured out yet as far as that goes. So that's a work in progress. Because all that I preach and rant and brain dump about on here regarding our ability to sit and quietly be with ourselves in these you know open, stripped away, authentic, genuine ways, that part of me doesn't coincide with tweeting all the time. But then look, I've been posting, I started on TikTok again, which is a whole nother crazy thing. I've been posting clips of this show. And again, it's all a work in progress. This is all new to me. I talk about all the time. I didn't grow up with this stuff. I didn't grow up with social media or computers or internet for that matter. So I feel like a lot of people in a similar position are kind of trying to navigate all this stuff for the first time ever, for the first time ever, for humanity and society at all. I mean, unless you're born with it. So 
I guess I mentioned all that as a way to just kind of share what probably appears to be a little conflicted and inconsistent when it comes to doing this show. And if there's people out there that like and appreciate listening, I appreciate you guys more than anything. And so you're really who I'm explaining that to because, again, I do feel like the interaction and the connection with an audience, for lack of a better term, I think ultimately that really is the most important aspect of doing this in whatever form that comes in. Anyway, moving on. And by the way, I'm going to be doing a list at the end of this show. I'm doing top 25 Pearl Jam songs. This is going to end up being a long episode just because of that list being so long. The first list I ever did on here was Dave Matthews' top 25. Ever since then, most of the lists are top 5, top 10. 25 is a lot, but if Dave got the... Here's the problem. I was going to do top 10 Pearl Jam songs, and I was like, how can I leave off all these songs... Then I was do 15, then I was tw- I stop. I go, let, let me just do 25. There's only a couple bands I'm ever going to do that for. Dave, PJ, maybe I'll do GNR one day, but I feel like that might be a top 20. In any case, coming up at the end or the second half of this show, top 25 Pearl Jam songs. So uh, stay tuned for that. But yeah, I want to talk about progress. This is something I've been thinking about a lot lately and something I've been having conversations about with people. And It's an interesting thing because when you say progress, you know, people measure, how do you measure that? How do you gauge that? How do you gauge that in life? You have internal progress, you have external progress, but the feeling of progress or the recognition or the acceptance that I've progressed in some way, whether that be with some goal you have, some career thing, some sport you want to get better at, getting in better shape, and you have all the internal progress, which I really think, and this is kind of why I want to delve into it. Because the internal progress stuff is only evident to you. And I think when it comes to progress, that's a big determinant of people's happiness and how content they are with themselves. If they feel like they have made progress in the ways that are important to them. And something I do always say about progress too, it's it's not a straight line either. So it's how do you measure something? Because to be honest, really you need those downs for the ups to even happen. It's the the hardest and the most painful times that really ultimately, again, not in a straight line, end up often causing or being responsible for the most progress of all, which is also why it's an interesting topic to get into. And yeah, ultimately, like everything else I talk about, when it comes to progress, I think just number one, we have to be brutally honest with ourselves. Because if if we're not looking at ourselves objectively, we're not going to be able to gauge anything. But yeah, everyone has their own set of issues and therefore everyone's going to have their own journey of progress and things that they feel they need to improve upon. That's the word I was really, improvement. When it comes to progress, people need to feel that they've improved in whatever ways they feel that they need to improve. And then maybe the ways they think they need to improve aren't the things they need to improve upon. Maybe they should really just be leaning into and improving upon totally different things. I do think that's actually an important part of it is recognizing our strengths and what we're good at and leaning into that stuff and kind of dropping all the stuff we think we should be good at because other people are good at it, but it's not shit that we're into or stuff that we're naturally inclined for. And the reasons we want to be better at it are not the right reasons. I think that about kids a lot too in school. And even when I was a kid, if if your kid's really excellent at something, maybe they're amazing at writing and they're amazing at English, but they're just terrible at math. You know, rather than hound them on the math stuff, let them just squeak by at it and go, hey, you know what? You're acing all your English stuff. Do even more English. You're amazing at it. You can make a career out of that. You're passionate about it. You enjoy writing. Forget algebra. I don't care if you get a a C minus in algebra, whatever. I think in life, everyone could just kind of benefit from that mentality. Rather than looking around and comparing themselves to people as adults, I see it all the time and they go, this person's great at that. I wish I was great at that. Well, well, maybe that's not your thing. So what are you really great at that you're not spending? Maybe don't spend that energy comparing why you should be good at this thing that's this fad and everybody's into and everyone thinks is cool. Drop that completely. Put your energy into this thing that you actually enjoy and that you're naturally a little better at. But yeah, I think external progress is much easier to gauge. But when it comes to internal progress, and I was talking about this on the last show, how much the things that we feel define our experiences completely. What we feel during an experience defines the experience itself. And I'm not going to repeat that whole rant, but just really think about there for anything you've ever gone through. You only remember it at all in most cases, but certainly 
you only remember it in the way you remember it because of what it felt like to you at the time. What was the meaning behind it? If it wasn't meaningful, you probably forgot it altogether. But yeah, a bunch of people could go through the same thing. One would think it's great. One would think it's terrible. Three would find it forgettable. Fine. But so you can progress in the way that you feel internally and react and respond to different things that unfold in your life. And everyone has you know, their own set of issues and things that they battle with their whole lives and stuff that they do feel that they need to improve upon and make progress with. You know, I've talked a lot about recently my own issues growing up with some of that anxiety type stuff and how kind of trapped and claustrophobic I can feel to this day in certain settings. So that's a big thing for me, for example, that I gauge internally as a huge progress thing that other people would never understand or know about or pick up on. Like I said, most 99% of the people in my life never even knew that I was dealing with that, even at my worst. But so, for example, if I have to take a flight somewhere or if I have to sit in a crowded, noisy restaurant and I'm feeling squashed in and trapped or whatever, the way that I feel now compared to how I would have felt 20 years ago is night and day. It's night and fucking day. Now, if you just looked at it objectively, if you took 100 people and you sat them in this crowded noise, I'd still probably be on the higher scale of people who are uncomfortable. So therefore, I can't gauge my progress by looking at other people. If I was to look at other people and go, well, how come this guy isn't uncomfortable? And by the way, maybe he is and he's hiding it just like me. But just for argument's sake, let's say the majority of people don't feel the same discomfort level that I do in those types of situations. Well, I'd be crazy to look at them as some sort of measurement for how I feel and then critique or judge myself on that. If I simply look at how I would have felt in that same situation when I was 24, 25 compared to 44, 45, well, that's huge fucking progress. Like I said, it's not even in the same universe. So when I think about it that way, I give myself a huge pat on the back and And that's not just accidental either. I've actually put in a lot of effort and work to get to those places. And that's just that's just one example. And in thinking about progress, when I was going to come on here and talk about it, I was thinking about internally all the ways that I'm able to do stuff with ease and comfort that I never could before. And at the time, had you told me and had you allowed me to feel what it would feel like for me now to do certain things. I'd have been ecstatic. I would have been so proud of my future self and I would have just been ecstatic at the idea of being in a place like that. And so that's number one when it comes to progress and all. And why I think I even chose to discuss this topic is that I don't think people give ourselves enough credit. We don't give ourselves enough credit. A, we kind of see things as gradual and we don't really even understand the progress we made because it's not like we're just jumping from that 24-year-old to the 44-year-old. It's this gradual thing and it's just our default nature to be hard on ourselves. And then B, we do kind of compare to other people. So yeah, we should only ever be comparing with ourselves and where we started and where we've come from. And again, it doesn't matter if other people can't see and understand and recognize it. They don't know where you come from either. Like to even factor that in is crazy. You really just have to look at yourself and objectively say, this is how it used to be and this is how it is now. And whether that's the way you react and respond and rebound from internal conflicts and things that only would affect you and only you could understand anyway, well, that's the most important stuff. If before something would have happened in your life and it would have made you feel shitty for a week and you would have been ruminating on all this stuff, And now the same type of thing can happen and you're cool a couple hours later. Well, that's huge. Then you've literally changed some of the most foundational stuff there is about existing in the world. So you don't need validation or reassurance or anyone to look at you and recognize that you you got to really look in yourself and be so damn proud of yourself for some of that stuff. People aren't. They aren't proud enough of themselves. They don't pat themselves on the back for all those victories that are that are internal that people don't recognize. Yeah, the external stuff's easier to gauge, but even then people don't give themselves enough credit. Like, let's say you're someone who's totally out of shape, right? And now you get yourself into excellent shape or what's considered for you excellent shape, which is my point. You're not going to want to look around now at people who are just in peak physical condition and go, well, how come I don't look like them? Because compared to where you were at, you're in amazing shape and now you're a million times healthier and it's going to affect your life in all these beneficial ways. Yeah, even the external progress stuff. 
if you have a job and you got raises and you got promotions and five years later you're doing way better, why would you look at people that have other jobs that you think are In other words, always look at your own personal progress. That's the only barometer. It's the only measurement that's a factor in. I'm sure a lot of that sounds cliche, but I don't see people doing that. Here's another example of like an internal progress thing that wouldn't really make sense to other people, but it's important to mention this because I think everyone does have their own version of this stuff. Again, we all deal with our own internal barrier. That's the point. We all have our own internal barriers and walls and obstacles. So if I get over one of those and I break one of those down and now I'm doing something that everyone could look at and go, of course, that's a normal thing to do. But for me, it's huge. For me, it's a huge progress thing. And yeah, I think everyone has that in some way. So I took a trip a few months back to down to the Keys. I went down to Key West for like a week. I do some of these little mini road trips and stuff, which, by the way, road trips, amazing resetters. I got one coming up soon. I'm excited about going to be back in my old hometown for a bit. So I'll keep you guys posted on that. But anyway, I was down in Key West. And when I checked into the hotel, the concierge guy he goes, hey, if you want to rent a scooter, because when you go down and do and people have been to Key West, Duval Street is like the main strip there. And at night, especially, it's impossible to park. Like, yeah, you could Uber. I'm not necessarily a huge Uber guy, but in any case, the guy goes, you should really rent a scooter. And then I started talking to this other older couple. They're like, yeah, we rented a scooter last week. It's amazing. And they were like, you know, 50, 60 something years old. And here's the point. I It's not something I really would have done before. When I say scooter, I'm not talking like those stand up on for kids. I mean, like a real scooter, like a Vespa style scooter. And I hadn't driven a scooter, I don't think, since I was like a teenager. But immediately I was like, yeah, I'm going to get a scooter. That'd be awesome. Because if, when, Key West, the whole island of it, you could wrap the whole island in like 10, 15 minutes. You could just drive around. You got the Gulf side and the ocean side. You go down to the southernmost tip of the U.S. I mean, it really is pretty just to even tool around. So I was already picturing that. And so anyway, long story short, yeah, I did the scooter. I had the guy bring him by. But so the whole week I was there, I didn't even want to drive my car. I was tooling around on this little scooter. And it was amazing. It was a little sketch funny in my head. I was just talking about this in regard to working out and playing basketball and things or doing pull-ups. You know, in my head, I'm still 12 years old. In my head, I could still jump up and do a bunch of pull-ups and things like that. Run races, drive scooters. So yeah, in my head, I was like, fuck yeah, I could drive a scooter. And he originally dropped it off and I hopped on. I was like, whoa, it's a little sketch. I rode it around the hotel property for about 20 minutes before I took it on the street. I had to get the feel of it real quick, but... Yeah, by day two, I was a pro on this thing, and I'm taking it on the highways and everything else. So my point in mentioning all of this is even in the moment of driving all over Key West for the weekend, even then I was actually recognizing the, um, which is rare for me, the I'm proud of myself part. Now for anyone else, they're like, who wouldn't want to go to a resort island and rent a scooter and drive around? Like, you're probably even confused why I'm mentioning this as some sort of personal feat or accomplishment. And not that it's something I would have been phobic about. It's just not something I ever would have done. As an adult, anyway. And it's also, by the way, it's interesting. A big progress thing with me that I talk about all the time is, I think, getting back to, it seems counterintuitive, but getting back to our childlike essence. Before we built up all these weird conflicts and walls and stuff that we don't understand. Like, why wouldn't I? As a kid, it would have been something I'd be dying to do. For some reason, then we we structure and we cut different things out of our lives. And I don't know. It was very exhilarating. And then even after the trip, it was my favorite part of it. And I'm always going to remember that week where I was just riding that scooter around down there. And for sure, I'm going to go down there again and get a scooter again. Or rent a scooter at the next island place that I go to where it's easier. That's the whole point, too. You could park that thing anywhere. They have kind of like bike free scooter parking on every block. So pro tip, if you ever do go down to Key West, get yourself a scooter, any little side street off Duval, you can just park that thing for free at any time of day or night. So yeah, that might sound like a silly example, but there it happens to me often. There are things I do all the time. There are places I'll go or stuff that I'll have to deal with that for sure back in the day either would have been totally out of my comfort zone, something I just wouldn't ever think to do, or something that I would be extremely uncomfortable doing. And then I do it. And because of how I feel internally while I'm doing it before, during, and after, I really think, wow, look at all the progress I've made. 
And I never used to do that. That's why it's important. I never used to. I would still beat myself up. I'd, and I still have a default of that. I still fight against it. It's a conscious decision now to really pat myself on the back and be proud of myself in some of these moments compared to how I was. And so none of that progress, none of those improvements are stuff that would be clearly externally evident to anyone else. And so what? We have this thing where we kind of view ourselves through other people's eyes. And we go, well, would someone else find that impressive? Well, if they wouldn't find it impressive, then I shouldn't be proud of myself or impressed with myself. No, you should be really proud of yourself for doing that kind of stuff and making those kind of improvements. Only you know how much progress you've made because only you can feel those differences. Don't diminish the results just because they're not maybe clearly evident to other people. Or because if you compared yourself to some other group of people, it might not on paper seem all that impressive. Look at how far you've come. And listen, if someone knew you well enough, they'd know, right? There are probably those couple people in your life that they get it. And if not, fuck it. It still doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, all the stuff I even talk about on this show as far as, you know, the dispelling false beliefs and the living in the present. Yeah, all of that's internal progress. And yes, it will ultimately manifest externally through your relationships and the health of your relationships and career stuff and passion projects and pretty much everything you do will then obviously be affected by the level of internal progress you've made, but it's still internal progress. It's still the foundation. It's still the starting point. You don't even get the external progress without doing the internal work first, right? And yes, we should be inspired by other people, but we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to other people. And those are two totally different things. And in fact, the comparison stuff kind of flies in the face of the inspiration because there's always kind of some source of resentment or something there. Like, oh, this person's better at that. It's never, I'm thrilled for this person that they're great at that. That's where the inspiration part comes from. If you can look at someone and be genuinely happy and go, that's amazing. There is a selfless inspiration to be gained from what other people do. But in order to have that, yeah, you got to drop all the ego stuff. Something else I've talked about before when it comes to progress and how we sometimes recognize it when we don't even realize that we made it. Oftentimes something that happens is, you know how a scent or a song and things like that can really bring you back to another moment in time? This is something I've had happen my whole life, which is oftentimes a scent or a song or something will catapult me back to another moment in time. And then I'm able to feel for a minute how I felt in that prior moment and then I'm kind of hit over the head with the contrast of this moment versus that moment because you actually are kind of going along thinking you still feel the same way and this applies to all things good bad and different but you're going along and you feel for a second oh shit that's how I felt at that time a year ago five years ago ten years ago And then you're hit with the realization of, wow, I feel totally different now. And a lot of times when that happens, I experience the biggest recognitions of progress because I'm like, wow, I would have thought that I was still feeling that same conflict around that same thing. And then you realize, wait, I don't feel that way at all. Yeah, we got to look inward for most of these answers, not outward. I'm like a series of cliches on here. Listen, cliches are cliches for a reason. The reason these statements and sentiments have become so popular over the years. And it's funny, too, because so many of them throughout my life have just really sounded like these throwaway lines. And as I've gotten older and a bit more existential with stuff, you realize how deep some of these simplistic statements really are and how foundational they really are to having a positive and healthy existence. There was a recent podcast guest I was watching on Rogan. He was talking about connection and status and how that's such a biological need built into people. It made me think sometimes with these rants, I'm a little bit maybe too simplistic or even ironically abstract with some of the stuff. It's like, just do this or just do that. Because a lot of that stuff is built into us biologically. He was talking about from cults, you know, people joining these cults all the way to religion and politics and all these things, how everybody craves, to some extent, connection and status. And not status in the way that everybody craves attention. A lot of people don't want attention, but even within themselves, they want to be known as a good version of something. So for example, if you're a devout Jew or a devout Catholic and what have you, well, now your connection is that religion, right? So you have the connection. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Jew. I identify as this thing. But now you 
also need that status within the group. You not only need to be the Jew or the Catholic, you need to be a good Jew or a good Catholic. What are the things I now need to do? I'm a Jew. I identify. Okay, now what do I need to do to be a good Jew? To have the recognition and status within that group. That satiates a very deep thing in people, even political. I'm a conservative. I'm a liberal. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I'm a good conservative. I'm a good liberal. And you look at cults as a microcosm of that because it really hits at, this is what you were saying, it's so appealing for people that you think would never be susceptible to such a thing, but they're offering you just kind of a straight line dope in your vein version of Here's your connection. You're part of this group now. And now to gain status within this group, here's what you have to do. Here's how you have to prepare your food. Here's the way you need to make your bed. Here's the clothes you have to wear. Yeah, it's what do I have to say and do and believe to gain status within this group as being known as a good one within this connection I have formed. And I'm really paraphrasing there, but it was really very astute. And you can really just look around and see... They were even using it as an example of waiters and car salesmen and people that kind of adopt this. Because if you look at a waiter in a nice restaurant, they've adopted the waiter behavior, the way they walk, the way they speak, their whole mannerisms are changed because, okay, now what group am I connected to? I'm a waiter. Well, now I look around. What do I do to be a good waiter? Well, here's what these other waiters are doing. What do I do to be a good car salesman? What do I do to... And people adopt the behavior of whatever group they formed a connection within in order to feel that status within it. It's a very interesting thing to ponder and consider. And you start looking around and you notice it everywhere. And again, I feel like in some regards it made me think I am kind of too hard in judging that. Because I'm always like, stop looking at what other people are doing. Stop conforming to what this guy says or does or whatever. Just be yourself. It's like my biggest rant. Just be yourself. Just do you. But yeah, it's not so easy. And it, it kind of goes against the grain of some of our natural instincts. And I think in a different type of society or human construct, maybe we wouldn't have to fight against it so hard. Wanting to join and be together and communal. It's kind of the way society is set up. And because there is so much fake bullshit and there is so much grifting and so much predatory even behavior towards so much of that stuff, that yeah, everyone's just grasping at the wrong things, so... Yeah, and sometimes when it comes to these biological needs and urges, and I touched on that a little in the last show or the show before, but just recognizing that something is kind of a biological or what's causing it, and that even relates, I haven't even really gotten into a lot of the stuff with my own general condition, but there are physiological reasons behind why I respond certain ways to certain things. And then just knowing that, it's even been a huge relief. I was talking to someone in relation even to hormones. They were saying once they realize that certain hormonal things that go on inside you are causing these specific types of things to occur, that just the knowledge and understanding of that alleviated the conflicted nature that was associated with it. I think that applies to a lot of things. Listen, people are weird. People are a mixed bag. Nobody is all one thing. We all have a lot of sides to us, and those sides can fluctuate, you know, it's all a little bit of a ride. I think we should all always embrace the good weird in us. Always be, there's good weird and there's bad weird, right? But you should always embrace that and kind of show that and not be even afraid at all to let that out. It's not, this isn't even a form of vulnerability like I talk about all the time with strangers and stuff, but you should be your weirdest self with people that you meet, especially if you think it's someone that you are going to form some sort of relationship with. Just save everybody the time. I don't know why I mentioned that. I recently watched this documentary on Netflix called Lover, Stalker, Killer, I think it's called. It's, whew, man, if you haven't seen this, I don't want spoiler alert. I might slip up here, so spoilers. Holy shit. What a crazy story this was about this psycho female stalker woman that was in kind of this love triangle, but not. I'm not going to recap the whole thing. It would take a whole hour. I'll do a separate show just on this documentary. Why am I bringing this up? I don't know. People are, some people are crazy. Be careful out there. Other stuff's actually reinforced that to me recently too, which is some people are fucking a little bit nutty and not the good weird. It's the bad weird. Something about women being psychos is so much creepier. I've discussed this with people before, but I think there's a couple reasons for it. I think, you know, if you look at this documentary or, you know, Misery with Kathy Bates or movies and shows and documentaries where the woman is kind of the psycho killer villain person 
it goes against their natural nature in a way that it doesn't with men. So like if you heard a guy murdered his neighbor, right? If that was on your local news tomorrow, dude murders his neighbor. You probably wouldn't bat an eye, right? If a dude murdered his neighbor over some sort of parking dispute, whatever, you wouldn't bat an eye. In fact, you wouldn't automatically even assume that the guy's a psychopath. You would just be like, I'm just some aggressive dude. Maybe the guy had a few beers. Maybe he didn't mean to kill him and he knocked him out and the guy's head smacked against the curb, whatever. There's a million things that could have happened. Dudes are killing each other all the time. Now, if you saw in the news, a woman killed her neighbor, obviously also just the fact that it's it's much more statistical anomaly. So that would make you obviously pay a little more attention to it. But you would also immediately think, oh, she's psycho. Because it's like only a psycho woman would do that because it's just it's against that nurturing nature. And so that makes it feel kind of more chilly and creepy. Yeah. And then also with women, it's like with a dude, there's a certain kind of aggression that you see coming. I remember Jordan Peterson used to talk about this a lot with young men and women in school and how when guys get aggressive, they'll punch you in the face. They have confrontations. It's not even as deep of a thing. It's a quick burst kind of outlet and then they go back to being friends. And not that girls, especially today, don't get into a ton of fistfights because that is really common too. But generally speaking, yeah, the girls will resort to character assassination and kind of these backhanded, underhanded things and yeah, you'd, you'd probably just rather have the guy coming at you. Like, just punch me in the face. Let me see it coming. Let me know what I'm getting. I don't want to be worrying about having my bank accounts hacked two months later and someone spying on me at my job and slashing my tires when I go into the grocery store. So it's creepier in that regard, for sure. Like, if you thought about how many cars have been keyed and tires have been slashed, that's got to be 98.5% women, right? Yeah, and there's just something way creepier about that. I don't know, it was a weird side tangent to go down. But yeah, to reiterate something I talked about the last show, there's there's people for everybody. There's the good weird and just embrace your good weird. And I saw someone else talking recently about compatibility versus being complementary. Complementarability, that's not a fucking word. But being compatible versus being complementary, meaning someone doesn't have to be just like you. In fact, the contention of the guy saying this was that It's better when they're not. It's better when they actually compliment the little things in you that you feel you need to be better at. And then when you compliment the things that they think they need to be better at. And I thought about that. You know, that's true for me. So, for example, I talked about all that other stuff I deal with before. You know, I'm not a very spontaneous person. I never have been. I've always been very controlling to a fault of my own environment and all that type of stuff. If you tell me, we're going on a road trip. I got to know how many miles, where we're staying. I'm going to want to drive all that stuff. And so I've never been the guy you could just throw me in a car, wake me up when we get there. I don't need the details. Now, the reason I mention that is the type of person I'd be even most naturally attracted to wouldn't be like that too. Imagine two people being like that. So it's, it's a perfect example of what would be complimentary to me is that spontaneous person, that person that doesn't need all the details. That person that can just hop in the car and go anywhere, they don't even know where they're staying until five minutes before they get there. And that's less of even, that's not even a lifestyle thing. That's that's a much deeper internal feels thing. It's what I was talking about before. It's two people experiencing the same thing, but feeling totally different doing it. And I think if you can experience things with those who they're feeling an emotion of going through that experience isn't the same as yours, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. That's what's complimenting you. People think compatibility, oh, we like the same movies or music or food or whatever. That's all very surface stuff. And people think, oh, you have to share these lifestyle things or they always go, sure, you have to have a shared value system. I don't know. I don't know. It's different for everybody. What I do know is it's nice to feed off people's energy that compliments you rather than just strictly going, am I compatible and do we feel the same way about this stuff? Because if you feel the same way about that stuff, not all that stuff's going to be a positive. I don't know how much learning and growth occurs in that type of dynamic. And listen, I don't know why I brought up that whole side tangent either. Maybe that was some follow up from the last couple ups. You probably have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. Okay. By the way, I'm an uncle. There's a side note for you. My younger sister had a baby and I am an uncle for the first time. So there's some good news. I don't talk about my personal life a lot, but that I would like to share. And they're up in New York, and I hope that they move down here so that I could be cool uncle guy and go to all the basketball and soccer games and stuff like that. 
There's really nothing I feel like I need in my life more than doing that kind of stuff. I want to get to the top 25 Pearl Jam songs list. My top 25 favorite Pearl Jam songs. I can't believe I'm doing such a long list, but I'll wrap up on the I'm an, I'm an uncle note. It's a good positive piece of news. And uh, and yeah, hopefully some of that stuff I said about progress makes sense and helps some people. I'm going to think about that. That was kind of my first brain dump on it. But as you see, every time I do these shows and I do that, I end up having it. So I'm sure next show I'm going to have a lot more thoughts on the stuff I said about progress and stuff that I didn't think to say that I feel is important. All right, top 25 Pearl Jam songs. These are my personal favorite Pearl Jams, I'm counting from 25 up to one. I'll try to go through these quickly. I know I say it all the time, but this, I think, really was my hardest list to make. Just the whittling down. Like I said, I was going to do 10, then 15, then 20. It did not get any easier, and the order was tough. And honestly, as I've talked about before, their debut album, 10, was really, in my opinion, the most flawless album ever and my favorite album ever. And the whole list really could have just been from 10. So I really had to think about it and parse that apart carefully. Okay. Coming in number 25, the song, and probably the most popular song, for sure, from a radio hit standpoint, it had to be, which is Alive, which is really a very dark song if you break down the lyrics, but it became almost this, and Ed has talked about this, Eddie Vedder, you got to call him Ed if you're a real Pearl Jam head, but it became kind of this positive anthem, the chorus that, ah, oh, 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 I'm still alive. And everyone loves shouting that. But again, it was one of these kind of darker songs about some really tough topics. And I wasn't even sure if it should make the list. And I ended up putting it at 25 because, listen, I'm definitely guilty of this thing where something's too big of a radio hit. If it just played over and over and over and it's like the one song that all the casuals know and everything else. Yeah, it kind of loses a little bit of its shine. But then I thought at the time when it first first came out, we loved it. And then also... How do you leave their most popular song ever off the top 25 list? So there it is, 25 Alive coming in. Number 24, song called Off He Goes, 1996 from the No Code album. And here's the thing about Pearl Jam and Eddie Vedder specifically that I've just really come to appreciate over the years is just what a lyricist he is and was. And I talked about this before in relation to other artists, but the fact that they were able to write these songs at such a young age, such poetic lyrics and the music to go along with it, but they didn't have all these reference points to draw from. They weren't able to just kind of go online and see 5 million people uploading all their stuff to Spotify and YouTube and everything else, and everybody's just kind of sampling and copying each other in a way. I mean, shit, you even have AI writing lyrics now that people think are superior. But to do it back then with not all those references and just kind of in a room by yourself, that's how I always picture these guys just sitting in a room by themselves strumming on their acoustic. It's just all the more impressive. And when I really was going through this list, I'm like, this guy's really a savant. The fact that he just wrote all these songs, there are just some true, iconic, legendary, all time savants. And it would sound crazy to say because everyone knows Pearl Jam and everyone knows Eddie Vedder, but I'll still say he's underrated and that they're an underrated band. Especially especially when you just factor in the longevity. Anyway, so yeah, that's 24, off he goes, 1996. I wonder about his inside. All right, coming in number 23, we've got Porch off 10, 1991. Listen, nobody's stuff is going to be as good as they're older. So if most of this list comes from 90s and early 2000s, obviously that's just the way it's going to be. Porch off of 10 was one of the kind of heavier upbeat songs and I enjoy those too. It depends on my mood. What the fuck is this world running to you? Then? All right, coming to number 22, another kind of more upbeat one off their second album Versus 1993 Animal. Amazing album. I don't know. I feel like I almost didn't do the album the justice it deserves when I'm looking at this list, but I'd rather be, I'm going to keep this list going, I'd rather be with, I'd rather be with an animal. I'm getting a lot of these verses and tens out of the ways early. Coming in number 21, we've got Oceans from 10. Hold on to the thread. Keeping it moving, number 20, verses album, second album. Elderly woman behind the counter in a small town. 
It's very pretty, reflective. So again, the poetry, if you look at the lyrics of some of these songs and you're like, this guy wrote this in his early 20s, back in an age when there was no internet and stuff. Is, do you find that as impressive as I find that? Hearts and thoughts, they fade, fade away. All right, coming in number 19. Listen, here's a couple caveats on this and a couple other picks. This is Eddie Vedder solo content. Look, I didn't go crazy with the solo stuff, and he's done a ton of covers. I try not to factor in all these weird solo covers he's only done a few times and things like that it wouldn't be fair to call those but it's my list i could do whatever the fuck i want and i kind of think of these as pearl jam songs and most of ed's popular solo came from the soundtrack for this movie into the wild which he wrote all original songs for that movie which also amazing movie if you haven't seen it true story so the first one making the list from that album coming in at number 19 2000 from 2007's into the wild soundtrack rise up eddie vetter solo slash pearl jam i don't care it's my list gonna rise up and find my direction magnetically i uh, coming in at number 18 off the 93 verses album daughter everyone i think knows this song this was actually a pretty big radio hit it's one of those that most people know the chorus to sing along to although there's some confusion around it because he's saying, don't call me daughter, not fit to. Surprisingly, I've heard people say, he's saying, why is he saying don't call me daughter? Like he's a guy, but he's telling his daughter, don't call me. Daughter, don't call me. But he's saying, don't call me, comma, daughter. Not fit to be. Meaning I'm not fit to be your dad. That's how I take it. There's a version of Daughter Live where they sing this cover. I can't even think of the name. I should look it up, but it's in, there's some foreign band. I think they're foreign. A song called It's Okay, I think. I don't know. But at the end of Daughter, some of these live versions, if you're counting that version, it would probably bump up to my top 10 because they break into that. It's okay. It's okay. You know, we love you anyway. Eddie always butchers the lyrics to that part but it is one of my favorite ones to hear live because of that alternate ending that they sometimes go into coming in at number 17 this is another movie soundtrack another couple of originals written for a soundtrack to me the best movie soundtrack of all time off the 1991 singles soundtrack which was about that whole grunge scene in seattle when it was first emerging there's a song called breath on there Tons of great people on that soundtrack. Uh, Chris Cornell, God rest his soul. You got Mother Love Bone on there. God rest him as well. If I knew where it was, I would take you there. <clears throat> oh, frog in my throat. It's much more. All right. Coming in, number 16, the opening track off the 10 album from 91 is a song called Once. Everyone knows that song. I was actually huge on this song when that album first came out. I thought it was dark. I was relating it to my girlfriend at the time, and it's just funny to think about. Backseat lover on the side of the road. I got a bomb in my tongue. It's gonna explode. All right, coming in. I'm keeping these moving. I don't want to give a whole diatribe on every song. I'm tempted to, but I'm going to keep it going. Coming in, number 15. All right, this is actually a cover. I was looking up some stats on this song. I was like, can I consider this a Pearl Jam song? Here's the thing about it. There is no studio version. The song is called, this is number 15, Throw Your Arms Around Me. This is a cover from an Australian band called Hunters and Collectors that came out within 86. I'm sure nobody's ever heard of them. PJ first debuted this live in 1992. There is no studio version of it. It doesn't actually appear on any Pearl Jam albums. However, also, by the way, I think the Talking Heads or somebody covered it a bunch. Point being, when I looked up the live stats, Pearl Jam had played this between Pearl Jam and then Eddie Vedder solo shows. They played it more than even the original band or anyone else that covered it. It's like 80 something times they played it live. So you play a song live that many times. To me, that's your song. And it's the only version anybody knows. And we may never meet again. So shed your skin, let's get started. Coming in number 14, off of 10, debut album, Garden. This is an overlooked song from that album. I don't think it gets it. And again, just lyrically, 
Lyrically, the older... By the way, these lists fluctuate. If you asked me to do this list a year ago, it would be a different order. So a lot of it kind of goes off current mood and we were talking about before, but if you ask me a year from now, it would probably be different again. This is a song I've come to appreciate more as time has gone. I will walk with my hands bound. Coming in number 13. This is another one that kind of has an old school feel to it. I didn't include, I'll just spoil, Last Kiss Didn't Make It. That's another one that has kind of the shout out Last Kiss, kind of that 50s feel. That oh where, oh where. That actually is a remake from the 50s or something, if I'm not mistaken. Don't quote me on that, I should know. But it, that one actually is an old cover. But this is not a cover, and I don't even know why I lumped it in. Actually, I do, because Throw Your Arms Around Me, which I had mentioned at 15 before Garden, and this song, Come Back, I always relate Come Back and Throw Your Arms Around Me in my head. Even though Come Back did not come out until 2006 on the album self-titled Pearl Jam, which I believe it's the only song on this list from that album, and 06 is like their newer stuff, so that makes sense. I've been wishing out the day is oh, come back. Coming in number 12, Indifference. I think the whole 10 album, other than a couple songs, made this list. Jeremy didn't make it. I've talked about that. Jeremy's like the only dark song. I've actually discussed that it was part of the worst car accident I was ever in when I was a kid. My sister was driving and that song was playing, but it's just a dark song. I can't imagine. And I say 10's a flawless album and objectively that is an amazing song, but you know, it's about this kid who kind of gets bullied and goes crazy and shoots people. And at least that's what the video, but even the song is kind of about that, this kid flashing back at everyone that's mistreated him. And I don't know. Not the kind of song I sit around trying to feel the emotions of. So Jeremy didn't make it, but I feel like most of the other lists did. Indifference, I feel those lyrics. That's all about, I'll do all these extremes. And then how much difference does it even make, right? I think we've all felt like that. I will hold a candle till it burns up my heart. Coming in number 11. This is an f- interesting song. Coming in number 11. It almost even inspired me to go beyond top 10 because I was like, how did Crazy Mary, the name of the song is Crazy Mary, how did it not make the list? And then I just went all the way to 25 once I had to add Crazy Mary. But here's another one that's not technically on any of their real albums. This was a cover also. A few things about this song. This was a tribute to this woman who (laughs) wrote the song named Victoria Williams. I'm not laughing at her condition. She had a multiple sclerosis. Pearl Jam sang her song on this Sweet Relief album, which was like a benefit concert for her. But she didn't release the song till a year later in 1994. So how they even knew to cover this, I'm not completely clear on, but it was such a deep, weird cut. When we were kids, I remember being like a freshman in high school. And as Pearl Jam fans, it was like, yeah, Crazy Mary was the song to really know because it wasn't on albums. It was only on this weird tribute album and you can only kind of hear it live. Also, I didn't even realize till discussing this song with someone within the last year that the song is about this woman crazy mary she lives on a curve in the road in an old tar paper shack and uh it's about this poor lady that they pick up and then she ends up dying and it's it's kind of a weird dark song again he didn't write it but you know i always pictured like this teenage runaway or something and uh it's apparently about an old black lady which apparently a lot of people knew but i never pictured crazy mary as an older black woman, but not that there's anything wrong with her being that. I just found it funny that it was never the vision I had in my head, but that's how lyrics are. Coming in, number 10, also off of the Eddie Vedder solo Into the Wild soundtrack from 07. This is the one everybody really knows from the movie. It's a song called Society. Again, just lyrically, again, just the fact that they basically handed this guy a movie that had no soundtrack and they said, hey, write the soundtrack and the dude wrote like eight ten original songs just for the movie it's like if the movie didn't exist it would just be a great album on its own to be able to even do that but yeah i think everyone's heard this that uh society your crazy breeze coming in number nine we got a thumb in my way i hope you're not lonely 
Without me. I had to finish that line. Coming in number nine, Thumbing My Way from the 2002 album Riot Act. This might be the only song I included from Riot Act. It is. It's another song over the years. This a few years ago, this wouldn't even made top 20. Now it's number nine. I have not been home since you left long ago. Thumbing my way back to heaven. Just a great song. Another great poem. Can't say enough about the pretty melodic poetry that this guy writes and turns into song form. Coming in number eight. Here's a song I've always loved. Also moved up the list a lot. Also very poetic. Nothing Man. I think this is the only one I have off Vitalogy, their third album from 1994. Nothing Man. Again, just a poem about the way relationships grow apart. How do you write that when you're 24 years old or whatever the fuck he was? You know what I mean? I know it came out in 94. He was probably like 28 or something. But when he wrote it, she once believed in every story he had to tell. All right. You know what I like singing any better? Because you can hit that. You can go up and down. You can hit the, the low note and the high note all in one. All in one note. I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to music structure. Okay, coming in, number seven. Here's one that's moved way the fuck up. From the first album, 10, 1991, Release. I always relate Release and Indifference, which I had at number 12. I kind of relate those songs together too, but they were kind of the same vibe off the same album. But again, the lyrics of Release have meant something totally different to me. It's a guy kind of singing to his dad. Oh, dear dad. Can you see me now? I am myself. All right. Like you somehow. All right, all right, all right. Coming to number six. Single soundtrack again. I had mentioned Breath before. This is really the bigger hit off singles. This song I've always loved ever since it came out. It's really high. Six overall, bro. That's really saying something about this song. State of Love and Trust. I think you guys know this one. This is kind of like, um, I like songs that kind of go fast, slow, fast, slow. They have pretty parts and then they kind of jam out. It's a good mixture of that. State of love and trust as I busted down the pretext. All right. Coming in number five. Here's a song, I'll keep saying it, that moved way the fuck up. Did I mention the Yield album before as being the only Yield? I mentioned something off of Yield as being the only Yield. But this is off the Yield album, or maybe I'm tripping. 1998. Talk about a poem. Talk about just a simple little tune only being a couple minutes and then just really breaking down such deep, nuanced thoughts. If you guys don't know the song Given to Fly, take a look at that. As far as poetry goes... Alone in a corridor, we locked out. He got up by the letter and wandered miles. All right, coming in. Number four. Here's one everybody knows. This is technically, this is tough to say what album it's from. Technically, this was, song is Yellow Lead Better. Number four, Yellow Lead Better. Everyone knows the song. Nobody knows the words to the song. And honestly, he sings them a little different every time anyway. And the song actually takes on completely different meanings when he changes the lyrics. But to be honest, I think a lot of those lyrics are mumbled on purpose because they're supposed to be left up to interpretation. I don't think there is any official lyrics for Yellow Lead Better. I think it's intentionally abstract and it's evolved over time. But just the when that guitar first comes in. It just grabs you, and then that. Um, this was an outtake. It was going to be on the Ten album. They had the Ten song. By the way, it's named Ten because of their favorite basketball player, Mookie Blaylock, who originally wore the number Ten. I'm talking about the album Ten. Is named Ten after Mookie Blaylock. And the original name of the band before they called themselves Pearl Jam, they called themselves Mookie Blaylock. I think it was Mookie Blaylock, the full name. There's some fun facts for you. But yes, it didn't make the cut for 10. Then it ended up, this is where we all heard it. It ended up, speaking of Jeremy before, being probably my least favorite song on the 10 album. When they released, if you guys remember, they used to release singles back in the day. 
you would just get the cassette with the one song and then or the record even but the b-side of the cassette would always have another song or usually would have another song and that was yellow lead better so more people bought the jeremy single because it had yellow lead better on the b-side that's why the jeremy single was so popular in my opinion because everyone i knew was obsessed with yellow lead better and they could kind of do with or without jeremy so it was on the b-side of the jeremy single then in 03 they put out an album called b-sides which was a collection of all these b-sides that had come out so it made that as well and then a year later they came out in 04 with an album called lost dogs which was meant to signify lost songs songs that didn't make the cuts of previous albums so being that yellow better also fit that criteria it was on the 04 Lost Dogs album, which a lot of people had. So it has kind of gained this huge following over the years, even though it technically wasn't an album song. It's made it onto more albums, even maybe at the end of the day, that aren't official albums. Yellow Let Better. That was it. Number four. All right. Top three. Now we're getting in here. The top two were probably going to be obvious. Number three. Man, you want to talk about a song that might not have even made the list five years ago. Also from the Into the Wild soundtrack in 2000, it would have made the top 20. It wouldn't have been top five or 10. No fucking way. Guaranteed. The song is called Guaranteed. It's also from the Into the Wild soundtrack. Also Eddie Vedder solo. I don't care. It's my list. I'll say it again. As a poem, it's probably the most poetic song of anything on this list, just in general, of anything almost anyone's written. If you ever listen to the song, it's called Guaranteed from 2007, Into the Wild. I probably quoted this song where it's like every line is just this deeply layered, nuanced, insightful thing. Living in a mind to silent. All right, coming in number two. Now we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. From 1991's 10, the song is called Black. Everyone knows Black. Listen, this is just that song. And really the live versions of Black where he gets... It's really the ending, the last few minutes of the song. You get the guitar solo and then that. I know someday you'll have a beautiful life. I know you'll be a star in somebody. But then he goes into the... In a lot of the live versions, it's that... We were alone together. And it just goes crazy with it. And then there's even some alternate versions of that. There's a deep, deep rabbit hole to go down of black songs. But it's just that song. If you took any heartbreak, breakup, angsty type song from my whole life, that would probably just be number one on that list. It just really hits that stuff in a way that very, um, forget Pearl Jam, just very few songs, period, in general, get close to drum roll number one this is obvious listen this song has made other lists i've done on here i don't care it's gonna probably be my favorite song if not my favorite top two three songs of any artist anyone all time really not a lot of suspense here the song is called just breathe from 2009 from the backspacer album it's ironic that my favorite song of all ends up being the newest that 09 backspacer that's the newest one on the whole list really goes against what i was it, it, that really speaks volumes about the song because i'll say it's someone blue in the face and if you look at this list 91 93 etc etc 98 what have you almost all my favorite songs draw back to those formative years and that's true of everybody you ask someone in their 50s hey what's the best music era they'll go it was the 70s it was the early Whatever people were 13, 16 years old at the time, that's always going to be their favorite stuff. But in this case, I was 30 when the song came out, but it's just a perfect fucking song. And yes, Willie Nelson did a cover. Y'all can pretend it's better. It's not better. Here's another fun fact about this song. The melody of it, and here's why I think it jives with that other energy too. The melody of it was written for that same Into the Wild soundtrack in 2007, the one that had those other few songs I mentioned, Society, Guaranteed, etc. Really shows what an amazing writing place he was in at that time, but it didn't make that album. It was just a melody. And then he wanted a couple years later to develop it into a full song, so he gave it to the band. It actually officially became a pro... Even though he he 
performs it solo a lot. It's technically a Pearl Jam song from the Pearl Jam album, and they'll do it solo, and they'll do it as a band and what have you. But So yeah, the melody was from the 07 soundtrack, then the song came out a couple years later in 2009. Just Breathe, number one favorite Pearl Jam song, closing out the top 25. Yes, I understand that every life must end on. All right. That was a long list. Like I said, if any band deserves it, I don't know that I'm ever going to do a top 25 again. I did it for Dave. I did it for PJ. I don't know that anyone else gets the 25 treatment, but I'm going to still do mostly music lists. I feel like music are the most fun list for me to do, and I feel like just music is a bigger part of my life than a lot of other things that I could list. So that is all. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. I hope everybody's having a great week. I hope everybody's been great. I will be back on social media soon if you guys want to hit me up on Twitter. And I will be back with another episode of the show soon as well. Really, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you more than you know. And I will see you all again soon. Be good. <laughs>